I am Sherry Sandin, Associate Professor of Early Childhood Literacy at Illinois State University. I am Cassandra Mattoon, Kindergarten Teacher at Metcalf Laboratory School at Illinois State University. What we will share is a glimpse into our learning journey exploring literature discussions in preschool classrooms. What began as a fairly standard research study morphed into a learning partnership, prompting as many questions as answers, but definitely resulting in stronger understanding for both of us about the extraordinary potential of preschool literature discussions, as well as research partnerships. From my researcher perspective, I undertook this study through a social constructivist lens, believing that individual knowledge construction is socially mediated as a result of cultural experiences and interactions with others in that culture. Viewing the early childhood classroom as a particular type of culture, the adult to adult, adult to children, and children to children interactions that occur have the potential to support the cognitive growth of all participants. Research demonstrates that classroom literature talk, especially in a format that encourages active student involvement, holds possibilities for advancing not only text-based skills, but also students' literary participation and higher level literacy understandings. Despite considerable evidence of benefits from interactive literature conversations, however, such purposeful interactions are sometimes lacking in early childhood classrooms. Especially troubling is the possibility that children from low SES, culturally and linguistically diverse populations may be even less likely to benefit from high quality, culturally relevant literature discussions. While much evidence points to the value of the social environment to prompt student learning during literature discussions, many of these studies were conducted in grade K through 12 classrooms. An exploration of the scholarship reveals a lack of research attention to preschoolers literature conversations, especially preschoolers in economically and culturally disenfranchised populations. While there are many recommendations regarding the use of read alouds with preschoolers, there remains a need for stronger examination of how preschoolers engage in literature discussions, what understandings they demonstrate, and how teachers can best utilize literature discussions to support both the text level understandings and meaning making capabilities required by their student populations. Not surprisingly, many findings reveal the considerable importance of the background and beliefs of teachers on the quality of classroom learning experiences. Kindle points out the significance of this impact on the literacy classroom, stating, individual teachers' understandings of what constitutes best practice have a profound effect on how a child within a classroom experiences a literacy event such as a read aloud. Studies also demonstrate the value of pedagogical growth through teachers' reflection on their practice. Specifically, teachers' analyses of their own literature discussions have resulted in reflective decision-making around their discussion practices. The research questions that founded this study were, number one, what literary understandings are evidenced in preschool students' participation in classroom literature discussions? Number two, how do preschool teachers enable their students' literary understandings and participation in classroom literature discussions? Number three, in what ways does individual and group analysis of their classroom literature discussions support teachers' understanding about and participation in subsequent classroom literature discussions? This resulted in a multifaceted inquiry, looking at children's and adults' responses to the social interactions around the literature discussions themselves and at the subsequent exploration of them between the teacher and researcher. I began reflecting on my read aloud practices while taking a graduate course at ISU. I started to view read alouds differently and saw them as a time to have meaningful discussions to deepen children's understanding of the text, the world, themselves, and others. 
did not have to simply be a time for them to sit quietly while I read a book. The read alouds could be so much more. While taking that course, I gradually began talking more about parts of the story, asking more questions, and allowing children to respond to the text more freely. When Dr. Sienan approached me with this research project, I immediately agreed and knew it would further my read aloud practices. From my teacher perspective, I wanted to improve in my read aloud practices so that the children gained academically, socially, and emotionally from the experience. I wanted children to develop a love for reading and literature and be able to have meaningful discussions about the text we were reading. I wanted to improve in my facilitation of these discussions and learn to appropriately respond to the children's comments during the read aloud session. Recording, transcribing, and analyzing the data would greatly impact my reflection process. Data collected in this study consisted of audio recorded and transcribed literature discussions in four preschool classrooms, one per week across four months, audio recorded and transcribed conversations between the researcher and the four teachers about the transcribed classroom literature discussions, audio recorded and transcribed teacher interviews occurring before and after the study. Today we will focus primarily on findings resulting from data collected in Cassandra's classroom, though we will pull in a bit of data from the other classrooms. A recurring theme in our study, as evidenced from this quote pulled from a teacher researcher conversation, was the idea of balance. How do teachers balance open conversation in a literature discussion while keeping it moving, letting everyone in, and meeting curricular intentions? And how do teachers achieve this balance within existing time limitations? Those three areas of balance will be the focal point for this presentation. First, we address the idea of balancing open conversation with keeping the discussion moving along. In one segment of literature discussion, when I was reading Murat on the High Wire, I allowed children to raise various topics during a page of text, taking several minutes to do so, and one girl became impatient. After several student comments, the girl said, turn the page. My attempts to allow the student conversation to flow did not meet the needs of everyone, particularly this student, who wanted the reading to move forward in spite of her peers' desire to keep discussing. In another section of the same story, the author mentions an instance when the tight rope walker was now afraid to participate, which confused the children. They demonstrated a need to talk it out, moving back and forth between asking questions about the character's fear and attempting to respond to their peers' questions. It seemed that they were making meaning in the experience of talking through the event with each other, and I allowed the children's conversation to continue before picking up the story again. This issue was raised in a subsequent teacher-researcher conversation in which we noticed in the transcript these needs of the children to both discuss and keep moving. We didn't resolve the issue, but the conversation created opportunities for us to both continue to consider it. So the question remained, what is the ideal balance between open conversation and keeping the story from lagging as a result of extended discussion? Allowing too much or too little talk during the story holds the potential for loss of meaning. A 
A second area of balance that surfaced in a number of our teacher researcher conversations involved balancing open discussions with ensuring everyone's access to the conversation. The four classrooms in this study varied in their expectations for children's verbal interactions. Between extremes of a requirement that children raise their hands and wait to be called on to speak during the literature discussion, to a classroom seemingly without any rules for classroom conversation, resulting sometimes in children talking over each other and all at once. In offering opportunities for open conversation, how do we ensure each child an opportunity to share? How do we manage the quiet versus the always talking children? Cassandra's literature discussions operated in an open discussion format, but it was clear from examples such as this one that efforts had been made to ensure that children began to learn conversational norms that would aid in having productive and meaningful discussions. Children should respond naturally to texts that are being read. However, there needs to be an appropriate management of these responses. A meaningful discussion can't take place if everyone is responding at the same time. For this reason, some rules for discussion need to be established as a class. These rules should begin to be established at the beginning of the year. Children need to learn to listen to one another. Listening is important when having a discussion at any age or place. There may be times when hand raising is necessary and other times when children naturally talk and respond to one another's comments. Managing the discussion is a balancing act and will need to be practiced and revisited over the course of the year. The discussion needs to meet the management style of the teacher and the children in the class. Some suggestions to consider when planning for the discussion and allowing everyone access might be Common Core State Standards for discussions with children, assigning whisper partners, and using sign language or gestures to ensure everyone has a chance to share ideas. These different types of class management techniques allow children to express themselves and be heard. The quiet child may use more of the gestures or be willing to speak more with their whisper partner. So the question raised is, how can a teacher balance a desire to allow children to engage in open conversation while ensuring all children access to the conversation? The third area of balance evident in these findings was balancing open discussion with curricular intentions. This raises questions about who holds the power in the literature discussions. When is it appropriate to follow the children's intentions and when must the teacher insert intentional instructional goals? How do you make sure curriculum goals and standards are met in the context of an open discussion? In this data sample from one of our teacher researcher conversations, we address my goal to insert purposeful instructional opportunities into literature discussions in ways that maintain the meaningfulness of the read aloud. In an example from one of the other classrooms, the teacher was also dealing with this issue of balance, and she realized that the completely open discussions she conducted did not provide her with enough opportunities to insert the kinds of experiences she wanted to move her children's literacy learning forward. She began to more purposefully include before and after reading experiences, like creating learning charts about story components, integrated with the open conversations she encouraged with students. Our follow-up conversation about her attempts demonstrated her awareness that open conversation and curricular intentions didn't have to compete, that it was possible to find a balance. A 
Over the course of this study, the ongoing conversations I had with Cassandra and the other teachers about the literature discussions that occurred in their classrooms offered opportunities for rich reflection on what we observed. Conversations about how the children interpreted book events in relation to their own lives, how the teacher organized a classroom environment that prompted students deep engagement, and how the language itself acted as a scaffold to support future events was fodder for ongoing wonder at the complex nature of literature conversations with preschoolers. Above all, we valued the joint exploration embedded in an atmosphere of shared learning that this kind of study inspired. While at times we might have secretly wished for some clear directives that supported our future read alouds, it began to dawn on us that rather than developing a recipe for what preschool literature discussions were supposed to be, we were crafting a series of questions for further exploration. Certainly, we developed some understandings about how preschoolers and their teachers interacted in the social environment of classroom literature discussions. And analysis continues across the whole study. But a major result of this study was the accumulation of layers of inquiry about how and why all of this happened. And most excitedly, we envision the possibilities of building on what we know to create even bigger ideas for using literature to enrich the literacy lives of our youngest learners and studying its results. We are still on our journey and are comfortable with not having an answer. Carol Dweck talks about two different types of mindsets, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Through our journey with read alouds, it is continually clear that we need to have growth mindsets. If I had fixed mindset, I would not believe that I could change and improve in my facilitation of discussions. We all need to try to be focused on growth. That means we accept the mistakes we may make on the journey, learn from our previous experiences, and keep trying new things. A growth mindset means recognizing that this journey will take time. I cannot reach my ideal read aloud discussion in just a few sessions. It is a constant reflective process. Teachers and researchers alike need to allow themselves the freedom to grow and accept that we may not be there yet, but by engaging in the journey, we will keep moving towards our goal.